If you're thinking of going cruising, then you're going to have to master anchoring if you want a good night's sleep. So in this film, we'll be looking at technique and at gear. Obviously, as with most things, a lot of people might blame their gear when perhaps it's technique. But gear is important. It's got to be fit for purpose. Uh, regular viewers will know that we've uh, recently changed our anchor chain. Uh, we had a problem with that. I think I found the ultimate anchor chain there. So we'll, we'll go through that. And yes, I will be touching on the issue of anchors. It's a contentious issue. I know people have their favorites. We may be changing one of ours and I'm going to do some more research. So I'll do a specific anchor video sometime in the future but uh, we get some ideas if you've got good and bad experiences with anchors then let me know about those but whatever your anchor is you've got to have the right technique to make it work let's have a look at this first little clip here of a typical anchoring situation one thing to bear in mind if you're coming into a, an anchorage when there's no real wind uh, is you don't really know where people's anchors are if you look at this anchorage here everyone's facing the same way but it doesn't mean to say that their anchors are all stretched out nicely in front of them and uh, so you've got to be sort of a bit wary give people a bit of space I mean this guy here who came in uh, last night is can't really see because it's a wide angle on this this lens but he's we're about 30 meters from me 25 meters I've got 40 meters of chain out there's no need to do that you've got a you know great big bay here could go anywhere you wanted Fortunately, when he came in, I could look at my anchor alarm and see exactly where my anchor was. And I could see that actually it wasn't, wasn't a big problem. It was, uh, it was the other direction from where he, he had put his anchor, but he had no idea where it is. But at the moment, my anchor is over here. So quite a way behind me, I'll have a little dive down and see just how far. So if a boat came in now and decided he would uh, sneak in somewhere back here, quite close to me, you wouldn't know that actually my anchor is right out there somewhere. I'll have a dive down and see exactly where it is. But yeah, you might expect it to be out front, and it really isn't. So do give people space, especially if you're coming into an anchorage with light or fluky winds. My anchor is here behind me, and it's in good sand, so as you might expect, it's well set, right up to the shank. Now let's have a look at the Beneteau's anchor. One would hope that choosing to anchor in such close quarters, it would at least have anchored securely. Well, there's no snubber and very little chain out, and oh, he's not actually anchored at all. And now sitting with his anchor the wrong way around, a bit of breeze would probably either pull the anchor like a sled or flip it over. He'd be very lucky to get it to bite. I did, of course, politely warn the skipper that his anchor wasn't set. His answer, I don't know what you mean. There's no helping some people. A quick look at the theory then. If your depth sounder is measuring the depth under your keel, then add the draft and the height of the anchor roller. We want a scope of about 5 to 1. So 5 sevens are 35, and we'll add out 35 metres of chain. This is to make the angle a taut chain will make with the seabed as small as possible. At 5 to 1, it's about 11.5 degrees. You can work it out that 3 to 1 would be about 19.5 degrees. And if you've really got space, put out 7 to 1. That'll bring it down to about 8 degrees. But going beyond 7 to 1 isn't going to change the angle much more. Of course, if you're somewhere with a tidal range, then that must be taken into account as well. So you have sufficient depth at low tide and enough scope at high tide. So make sure you know the state of the tide when you anchor. Okay, so we're about half the tide at the moment. It's about two and a half metres of tide. Okay. Another metre and a half. So I'll be looking at about five and a half, five? Yeah, five, somewhere around there. Let's see how far off the shore we are. After a piece we did on anchoring in one of the episodes, people did ask why we don't just put all the anchor out. After all, it's doing nothing sitting in the locker and with a powered windlass, it's no sweat to get it back up again. So if you've got the space, then, then why not? Well, the thing is, you very rarely stay in one place. Look at my anchor monitor here from last week. This is just one night at anchor. And you can see we've done a full circle. And there's no tide shifts or anything here. That's just the wind going, going around, light fluky winds. Quite often happens. And if that is happening and you've got a lot of chain out, you've got a big circle you're scribing. So if there's a rock, a coral head, something like that in the way, then you can get that happening quite easily. And that can be a real difficult thing to uh, unravel. So that's why I don't put everything out in one go. Anyway, that's enough of the theory for now. Let's have a look at how some of this works in practice. 
Okay, so we're just coming into our anchor position. There's a bit of a swell in here, so we might have to put out our, uh, our kedge anchor as well, just to hold us straight into it, because the, the wind's fluky. It's coming from the other way here. You can see it's quite deep a long way out. We're gonna have to go in quite close. Don't really know what the bottom's here like here. Hopefully it's sand. Um, we've got a little bit of a sandy beach there, which is quite nice. So I'll get the anchor ready, take the hook off. Judy will tell me when we've got the right depth. Let's get this ready to go. Okay, so I'm stopping now. Then when Susan is ready, I'm going to go slowly backwards. I'll let it free fall down, so Judy will stop the boat and then we'll, we'll drop it and bring it back. So yeah, you happy there? How much we got? Yep, that's fine. Eight. Eight? Okay. So we're just to be here, we'll be dropping the anchor. Okay, yeah, slow back. So I can just control it with the clutch here, but Judy will just take us slowly backwards and we'll stream it out so it doesn't all go down in a pile. So I'm going to put about 50 metres of chain out. We're in about seven or eight metres. I haven't got the chain fully marked up at the moment, so I can't uh, see exactly where we're in. I've got to mark at 40 metres, which is the yellow mark, so I'll wait for that to go through. There it is. Okay, slow us down. So Judy will just stop us there. And that should do us. So once I've got enough down, Judy will just set it. Okay, we just set it. All right, so Steve's finished setting the anchor. We're just gonna test it. So I've got the snubber ready. Ideally, you would connect that and actually pull on the snubber as you go back. Uh, but it's just such a faff with the, uh, the system we've got here to do it that we just do it gently on the chain. Just make sure the chain doesn't skip over the gypsy here. Uh, Wildcat if you're American. And uh, just get, make sure that we've set the anchor properly. So yeah, Judy's gonna keep going back. More. So we can just go back gently. And we want the chain to lift up and be properly taut and then just wait for that bounce back. I've got quite a nice bit over here. I can see at the end of that headland there, the parallax between that and the headland beyond it. So I can see us actually move forward, but you can normally feel it actually. So we'll see here, it's starting to go, yeah, keep going. So we do it slowly, especially with this boat. If you go a little bit fast, you'll get a little bit too much momentum and, uh, and then you will start uh, you know, skipping the, the chain over the gypsy here, which it really isn't good for it. Okay, so I just stopped to there. So that's nice and taut. And if you look at the headland, yep, I can see that's definite bounce back. And it looks, it's quite deep here. Uh, it looks white though, so it looks like we've got it in sand. I think that's good. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to put the, the snubber on. I've always done this with a rolling hitch. Yeah? I might succumb and actually get uh, a chain hook for this because it is a bit of a faff because of the way the rollers are, but uh, I'll do it like this for now. So if you're not familiar with a rolling hitch, then that's in the knots video. Have a little look at that. So once that's all on, I'll uh, just pull it through and tie it off onto the Samson post here, which is the strongest point on the, on the boat. It'll take all the strain off the, uh, the windlass. You can see I've got uh, the old rubber part of the snubber in there as well. That helps. I find about 10 metres of snubber is enough, but the road is longer than that. So if I need to let up more chain, I can. When this chain comes nice and straight, it'll start pulling through and it'll just pull that rope through. And I'll let a little bit of chain out. There you go, it's starting to pull. Oh, let's let enough chain out, we've got some slack there. It was light winds and the anchorage as we came in and we weren't expecting any sort of a blow. If we had been, I would have got Judy to back down hard on the anchor. We use about half throttle. We've got a, a feathering prop which gets good grip on the water and that'll give you about as much pull as 50 knots of wind. So we'd be pretty sure of staying put. The light winds though made it setting pretty easy in that instance. It doesn't always go that easily.
So you're motoring up to your chosen position. You find a good spot to drop the hook and start paying out the anchor as you go slowly astern. But then the wind does its thing and starts to blow the bow off. As long as you can still feed the anchor through the roller, don't worry about it too much. If you mess about, you're likely to drag the anchor prematurely. You don't want to put any pull on the anchor until you've got your 5 to 1 down, especially if you're in something like soft mud. Once your scope is out, you can reverse to set the anchor, and this should pull you straight. We sometimes have to use our back and fill technique to kick the stern around before we do this. You can help yourself out in the approach if your boat has significant prop walk in reverse. By coming in at an angle slightly away from the direction the prop walk will take you, you may have better luck staying head to wind, but if you have a full keel like Fair Isle, then all bets are off. Fair Isle responds more to current than she does to wind, so we'll have to work to that. Either way, if you have a bow thruster, then use that to keep you pointing in the right direction. I want to just briefly talk about uh, kellets as a, a bit of gear that you could have. This is a, a weight that you can slide down your anchor chain and it's uh, supposed to just sort of pull the cantonry down and, uh, and help the anchor to, to stay put. I'm just going to come out with it and say I don't think they work at all. Uh, maybe if you've got uh, rope road, a lot of rope road and just the end uh, as chain it may help there certainly to keep it down. I know a lot of people uh, have a problem thinking that they, they might swing and catch the keel on the rope because it, the cantonry isn't there, doesn't stay down uh, low enough and, and it might help with that. But as a, a the method of, of getting to hold really the best it's going to do is delay the point at which your anchor chain is pulled uh, directly taut so maybe that might happen at 40 knots of wind and having the kellet on there it might be 43 knots of wind at where it's actually pulled but the weight would have to be so heavy to, to make a difference it's it's not the you know i think a good way of doing it anyway a piece of extra kit that might be worthwhile though is an anchor riding sail to stop this it's not something that we have yet but i'm certainly looking into it the shearing forces as you go backwards and forwards will seriously increase the pull on the anchor you can also get problems retrieving the chain. Here's how we do it if things go well. So the anchor's probably pretty buried in there. You can see it's tight and straight down, so I'm not going to force it. We'll just stay there over the top of it, maybe overrun it a little bit to uh, work the anchor out rather than strain the, uh, the windlass doing it. This is actually easier when there's a bit of a, a swell. If you're out in the open sea, the, the swell will just uh, pull it out for you. Maybe we'll just wait, it'll uh, work its way out without forcing it. Right over the top, and I think that might have got it now. Need a bit of patience, and you don't have to force it. Of course, it's not always that easy. Anchors do get stuck most often under a rock, but usually, actually, just driving the boat forward across it and different angles will will pull it out. So we're going to try and jiggle it out using the weight of the boat. So I'm going a little bit forward, and Steve's at the front looking down. You can actually see the anchor because it's not very deep here and it seems to be stuck between two rocks. So we're going to be jiggling backwards and forwards I think. Right, so going forward fraction. Okay, now we're going back a bit. It's a matter of giving it a blast really. That's probably enough. Ooh, dear me. Dear me, dear me. Okay, done it? Oh wow, okay. <laughs> well, that was quite good. I happened quite quickly. Excellent. Yeah. So now we'll get the anchor up. Brilliant. Woo. Thank goodness for that. If you're somewhere where you know there's uh, a lot of bad stuff down there, usually it's uh, in harbours where there's a lot of old junk on the seabed, uh, I will actually put a, a trip buoy in there. Uh, so that attaches to the front of the anchor. So you can uh, just pick it up uh, maybe in the dinghy and pull it forward uh, to, to try and upset the, the anchor and pull it out uh, from the front end and um, that usually works. Uh, problem with these is that no matter what you write on them, people lift them. If you're doing it in an anchorage like we're sitting in here now, you can pretty much guarantee someone will come along and pick it up thinking it's a mooring boy. So I tend not to use them. And if you do get stuck, um, I have this. So it's just a, a short length of chain spliced onto some rope, which I can slide down the anchor chain and it can go all the way down and over the shank and do the same job as the trip boy. You pull it from the front and that will normally get you out of trouble. It'll, it'll do the job for you. There are some other things that we need to, to, to make and get done to get our anchoring how we want it. One of those is I want a chain stopper fitted here on the Samson post. With most boats you'd put it on the deck. 
but what that means is you would lock it off and it would take all the strain off the windlass and you can just make sure you, you do that before you set the uh, set the anchor and leave it there make sure everything's off the windlass it doesn't mean you want to do away with the snubber though the snubber is very important especially if there's a swell it's the thing that takes the shock loading out of the chain or the whole system and stops your anchor being ripped out of the seabed the weight of the chain does produce a cantonry, which gives some pseudo-elasticity to the system, but only in light winds. When the wind gets up, the chain will be pulled bar straight. For this boat, that's about 35 knots of wind. We showed what that's like back in episode 10. When the chain's pulled tight, there's no give in the system at all. That's what your snubber's for. You want at least 10 metres, no matter what size of boat. And when the wind and waves come, the snubber will smooth things out for you. In this instance, as the forecast said, we might get 50 knots. I used the bridle as well as the single line for my snubber as a backup in case that failed. The wind we were expecting has arrived. It's uh, gusting 40 knots in the anchorage this morning. We were in a good spot. We knew it was coming, so we've uh, we found a nice sheltered spot. Uh, but I have put the bridle on. I know we talked about uh, anchoring quite a lot in the in the last episode, so I'll make it brief. But uh, this is what we have here. You might just about be able to see there that uh, I've got a, a special little hook that goes on the, the chain that I can attach the bridle to. So you slip that over the top and I've got, uh, got it coming back and round the sampling post here. And I let a little bit more chain out so that just uh, hangs loose. So that big delta should be able to cope with this, uh, no problem at all. It's only really swell that, uh, that, that really compromises your, an your anchor if you've got a decent anchor. Um, we've got hardly any fetch though, so not too worried about the, the wind, I think we're fairly secure. Might need to rescue my shorts before they blow away though. I'm pleased to report the anchor and my shorts did both hold, but I did bend my anchor hook here. Uh, this is the one that goes on the bridle, which shows the sort of forces that are at play and the importance of an often forgotten part of anchor gear, your anchor chain. When we bought Fair Isle, she came with a stainless steel chain. The chain looked in good condition, but when I inspected it this, uh, this winter, you can see the signs of some corrosion. The chain is now 20 years old. Uh, so I went to see Chris, who's a materials expert and a yacht designer and consultant. So we can see, if you look at the picture there then, what's happening. So this is crevice corrosion, yes? Yes, this is crevice corrosion and surface corrosion at the same moment in time. Yeah. Um, but the, you can see on, on the picture, this, the crevice corrosion usually, because that's along the well, goes mm. in a 90 degree angle to the surface. Yeah. So it's very likely when yeah. we cut this open, yeah. it's in half the wow. the thickness yeah. of the material. So in fact, it's it's lucky there is some surface corrosion because that's the problem with crevice corrosion, isn't it? Is that yeah, it, to find it, you don't see to find it. it. Yeah. Um, uh, normally, all the, on, on I mean, this is this is at least this is the one for three uh, three one six Ti. Yeah. There are all also standard three one six chains on the market, mm. and they will have harsher hole corrosion. Now, before I let Chris go into the real technical details, let's just deal with a couple of misconceptions about stainless steel. You'll read all sorts of different things on the web that it's too brittle, that it can't be used underwater. And these things are just wrong. You just need to use the right sort of stainless steel. As yachties, we think of stainless steel as being 316, but there are many, many different types. And uh, 316 itself is not something that you would use for an anchor chain. There are much better alternatives than that. So you have to really look into what you're using. For the usage on boats, the most important point is the corrosion resistance yeah. of the stainless steel, and there's a wide variety. And it depends very much uh, on the usage. Uh, you get away with when you use screws on the rig or on the extension of things. Uh, on cheap boats, usually you find what we call in Germany A2, which is a standard 316, yeah. uh, which is, if it's occasionally gets some sort of water, might be all right and you can clean it. Uh, better quality screws normally are A4 in, in the German um, steel qualities. This yeah. e equivalence in the IC range is a 316 Ti or yeah. 316 L. Yeah. So that's what this is, isn't it? And, and this, one, four, this one is, four, a, is, a, is a 1.4571, so that's a 316 Ti. Um, they are both in Germany called A4, but they differ in the uh, and the uh, the corrosion resistance against chlorides, and um, they also have a different prain factor. Prain is a pitting uh, resistant equivalent number. Yes, is yeah. the the translation for it. And uh, the the problem what you normally have is as soon as you drop 
your your stainless steel in an environment where it's most of the time and salt water which it has its chloride and occasionally get some oxygen where it can corro when it can ha can have corrosion yeah um, the different stainless steels have a different brain factor and it is very much related to temperature so most of the materials usually used in Scandinavian or German or English boat builders, they're totally fine in the North Atlantic or in the North Sea. Yeah. Like this 316L, which is higher corrosion resistant than the 316TI. Yeah. Usually for the North Sea, up to 20, 22, 23 degree water temperature, it's totally fine. As soon as you hit the med or even worse, tropical waters, a stainless steel chain, which you think is completely inox, it's uh, yeah, non corrosion. Yeah. Yeah. Within half a year, it can degrade completely, and that's what I didn't realize. Because I mean, this the the when I bought this boat, this this chain was on the boat. Uh, I didn't get a handover because unfortunately the the, the chap that had owned the boat had died, so I, I couldn't sort of get information about what was there. Uh, and I sort of assumed stupidly that that because everything else on the boat was so well sorted, that he got the right thing, and actually he had, hadn't he? He got the right thing for, for the northern latitudes. Area, yes. But now I've come south into warmer waters. It makes that much difference, does it? Again, uh, um, uh, a ten millimeter, a ten millimeter um, three one six Ti chain can be. I know an example from an Austrian boat where the chain was eaten completely away within three months in the Caribbean. Wow! Uh, to the, the to the point that one of the, the the chain parts was eaten away that it was open. Yeah, it was just a leftover U shape. Yeah. So all this means, it, it doesn't mean that you should stay away, because a lot of people say, well, don't have stainless steel in the water then, don't oh. have a stainless steel chain. But there's advantages if you get the right sort of stainless yeah, steel. Yeah, it's tell, perfect. Tell, tell me about the right sort of stainless steel. Is, is there a company that makes good stainless the, steel the best, chains? The best uh, uh, products that are actually on the market, um, uh, they're from a German company called Velda. They normally, they, are, they fabricate these duplex chains because of their reliability and the strengths. Mm. The rough rule is uh, a t uh, uh, an eight millimeter duplex Ch chain yeah. is at, at least as strong as top quality material, 10 millimeter yeah, standard so chain. I've, heard that, I've read that and their tolerance is greater as well. Yes. So actually they build in yeah. you know, that sort of uh, tolerance uh, as well. A normal 10 millimeter, 10 millimeter chain has a, a brake load of uh, something like 5,000 kilos, mm. a little bit more. Mm. Uh, an 8mm duplex chain it comes close to 7 ton. Yeah. yeah the 10 amazing. millimeter, I don't know the exact figure, but it's yeah. two digits. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, mean I, I must admit, I like my stainless steel chain because it, yeah. it, it just it goes yeah, into the mean, anchor locker, never a problem. For me, it's a real problem. If, if I'd had, I was worried about going to, if I had to go to galvanized chain, because we know they don't stack so well. I have the same like, problem for me. Though. Yeah, but for me, I'd have to go uh, take everything out of my sail locker to then open the doors to the, to the anchor locker to get into the anchor locker, mm -hmm. which I do not want to be doing at sea. Yeah, I mean, on my, um, boat, on my boat, I have a, a galvanized chain at the moment. Yeah. And I can only get with the windlass effect. 10 meter of chain in before I have to move it. Yeah. Because yeah. on the catamaran, the anchor yeah. locker is very shallow. Yeah, yeah. So there's a lot of advantages yeah. for stainless steel. Well, also on a catamaran, it's lighter, isn't it? For yeah. A, for a given. Yeah, you can, you can, yeah. you can go for, for a smaller diameter yeah, yeah. for the same brake load. Yeah. But this is not the only advantages of a good duplex uh, stainless steel chain. Another point is when you're, uh, when, you will see that when, when you're in Italian waters mm. uh, where you have a lot of mud. Mm. Yeah. Uh, the cleaning of the chain in the yeah, anchor locker yeah. is a lot easier. Oh, I know that from England. We're, the yeah. east coast of England is just solid mud. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's and lovely to bring up a chain and, and have it clean. And, a, galvani yeah. a galvanized chain, uh, yeah. and every time you get the anchor, you, you have 10, 15 kilo of mud <laughs> in your anchor locker, which you have to yes. clean out. Yes. And also, if there is a problem, like we have here in these pictures, yeah. it's visible. Yeah. On a galvanized chain, you see nothing. Yeah. Normally yeah, yeah. they're dirty, they're crusted, yeah. they have a... Uh, um, because of their rough surface, there's even salt crusts on the yeah. on the on each chain link. So if there's damage underneath, you hardly see it. Yeah. So that's another safety reason. So I yeah. would never say stay away from, from no, stainless no. steel chain. Just use use the right material. Sure. Uh, I well, I highly, rec highly recommend the the Chromax chains mm. because a they are approved, they have uh, they are certified. Well, because these people manufacture chains. To, to carry stuff above people's head, yeah, yeah. Uh, they are certified welders. You can you can be sure that 
the quality is there because yeah. the chain is only as good as the weakest link. But obviously, they're also expensive. Um, so if you have to go to galvanized they're chain... They're expensive. They cost a lot of they, money. Yes. It's not the same thing. Very good point. Um, but but yes, yeah, so if you haven't got the money for that and you have to go to a galvanized chain and you think, well, what's the best galvanized chain? You hear horror stories of galvanized chains losing you know, the zinc within you know, months or yeah. you know, a year or two. Um, if you go for the high test, the 70, is it true to say you can't re-galvanise that, the heat-tested chains? Uh, or is depends, it going to compromise well, it depends. It, well, I'd say I would never, I would never give uh, a heat-tested proper chain to mm. an unknown galvanising company. Okay. The problem is, especially stainless steel chains, a lot of them now come from China. Yeah. There is, uh, it's like buying screws from China. Yeah. Well, some of them are stamped A2, some of them are stamped A4. Yeah. When you really check them, you find out it's exactly the same material. It's neither nor. Yeah. <laughs> so, but it's load testing the links as well, doesn't it? I mean, a good if you've got a good certified chain and it is certified that they've they've tested. Yeah, they, if yeah. you have a certified chain, yeah. it, but you will never get one out of China. Mm -hmm. And the certified chains, uh, when you look, even a normal 3160i or 316l certified mm. chain. The price becomes very close to a welder chain in the first place. Yeah, oh, really. Mm. So, mm. so uh, uh, on the other end, you cannot compare a, a double strand uh, Chromox chain mm. with a Chinese in the same diameter. I no. mean, you can get you can get uh, ten millimeter stainless steel chains now for thirteen, fourteen euro per meter. Yeah. But this is China. Yeah. Um, yeah. I would never ever, I would never ever use that in no. warm water because you don't know what you're getting. No, no. And you've got a very expensive boat and your own lives at yes. risk by so, a piece of chain. So it's, yeah. it doesn't make sense, does it? Yeah. I, w I would not risk that at all. Mm. I think the, these things, they save your boat when you're, under, when you're in a bay. Yeah. There's nothing else that's holding, it, holding you. It's this system and the anchor. Yeah. So I wouldn't compromise at all. People spend thousands and thousands and thousands of euros on gadgets on their boat uh, and when you see the price difference it's not actually that much to go for proper material to no. save your boat's life yeah yeah sure. and your own life yeah so after that chat with Chris, I talked to a couple of other experts and some sailors who've got uh, more knowledge and experience than I've got and came to the conclusion that Velda were the company to go for. So I talked to Alex, who's their technical expert there as well, who was very helpful and ordered the chain, uh, which came during lockdown. It was delivered during lockdown, typical uh, German efficiency, got there and we fitted it uh, a couple of weeks ago. This is 100 metres of Chromox chain. I would normally mark it every five metres, but with the chandelers closed for lockdown, I'm going to have to make do with the few spare markers I've got and just mark the 40 metre point for now. I find these rubber inserts the best. Paint will just wear off. This swivel is next on my list to change. I don't like swivels attached directly to the anchor as you can end up with a large prizing load on the jaws of the swivel. This one mitigates that somewhat by having a ball joint, but not completely. To match the strength of the chain, I really need to go for one of the new Chromox shackles, or better still, that anchor twister that automatically rotates the anchor onto the rollers. But that'll have to wait until the boat kitty recovers a bit. The anchor locker gets a clean out. Always make sure your limber holes are clear so your chain doesn't have to sit in salt water in the locker. Also, don't be tempted to store anything metal in the anchor locker. A rusty old gas canister, for instance, will not help you keep the chain corrosion free. I'm splicing 20 metres of road onto the end of the chain here, uh, not because I want to use the road at all, I've got 100 metres of chain, I don't need the extra length, it's just that for safety, if I need to cut the anchor away, it's much easier to have the rope there. Never shackle a chain into your locker. If you are intending to use the road, just be aware that a splice that comes back on itself is much stronger than one that weaves through the chain. I take the opportunity to grease the clutch on the windlass, you always want that to run free. Then load the chain into the locker with the windlass to make sure there's no twists in it. And from then on, just make sure you keep your chain clean with a fresh water wash as often as possible. 
Okay, I did promise to talk briefly about anchors. It's a contentious issue. People have their favorites. Uh, we have a Delta as our best bower anchor. And um, yeah, I don't particularly like plow anchors. We do pretty well with it. It's oversized uh, for the boat, uh, which I think is always a good thing. Get the next size up from uh, what's recommended uh, for the boat. But I probably wouldn't go for a plow anchor given the choice. I'm going to do a lot of research on this and, uh, and see what I think is the, the best anchor out there and do a specific video on that in some time in the future. So if you've got any real life experiences, do let me know what they are. I know there's a lot of Rockner fans out there. To be honest, I don't think it's something that I would go for. I don't like the big hoop uh, because it can get a stone in it or, or a lump of mud stuck there. And on a big wind shift, a big reset, it might not reset and you get a fast drag from that because it you know it just doesn't dig in at all really rare but you know i've heard a couple of cases of that happening and, and that's something that that has put me off i think at the moment i would go for something like a spade or an ultra uh, i know that uh, some people think the spade is over complicated and i know the aluminium version has uh, has some problems with uh, weakness of the shank there's been a few cases of uh, pinch shanks coming out from that but yes i'm going to look into this more i'll put some information on the uh, the website as well so there's a link to that uh, in the corner uh, go on there and i'll update that about the whole of this uh, um, anchoring video and the the upcoming one on anchors themselves if you've got any real life uh, experience just uh, tell us about uh, that with, with the anchors and I can include as much as I can. Uh, please do subscribe if you like this video. Thanks for watching.